Hi everyone, I'm Aries Keck here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and we're doing a hangout live today with two of our scientists who are pretty much at other ends of the earth and we've got a school that's here in Maryland where, uh, where Goddard is as well. They're at the uh, Naval Academy Primary School in Maryland. Um, we're going to be talking a lot today about Icebridge High School. We'll have going to you guys shortly and we're going to show some videos as well. Um, first, I'm going to introduce Nathan Kurtz. He's the project scientist for Operation Icebridge, and he is reaching us from what looks like an office or maybe a hotel out there at Quintos Aires, Chile. Nathan, can you say hi? Hi. All right, Nathan, so tell us what you're doing there in Chile. Uh, so we're here in Chile with a, a plane. It's called the, the G5. Uh, we've loaded up with instruments. We have a laser on board, a camera, and we're flying around Antarctica, around the oceans around Antarctica, and we're uh, measuring the ice, how thick it is, where we're losing ice, things like that. Fantastic. And now if you're watching this, um, as you can imagine, having somebody in Chile and another person in Greenland, um, we're going to be a little patient with our audio or any kind of technical issues. It's going as well as it's going so far. Let me see if I can bring John Woods, who's in Thule, Greenland, in. He's the project manager for Operation Icebridge, and I think he's, he's in the airplane hangar itself. Hello, John. Hi. Hello, everyone. Yes, my name is John Woods, and I'm currently the project manager for NASA Operation Icebridge. And unfortunately, we're not in our hangar, so our plane is actually in the hangar next door. But I do have two of our pilots here available to answer any questions, if anyone has any pilot-specific questions. All right, fantastic. Well, hey, let's, well, since we've got the pilots there, let's go talk to them right now. John, do you mind taking it away? All right, stand by one second. I'm going to unplug my headphone here, see if I can have each of them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Timo Forsen, and I'm Greg Slover. Was that audio okay? It's working fairly well. Um, so let's have, pilots, before we lose you, let me have you guys describe what it's like to go out on a flight. Okay. You mind putting on my headphones? I want to describe what it's like to go on a flight. Stand by one second. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, it's what it's like is that uh, we get up really early and we find out what the scientists want to fly yeah, based on the weather that we have. So and if the weather is clear, and so Greenland is a really big island, and so we look for really clear areas. So the instrument that we have, which is a laser and a camera, can see all the way to the ice. And based on the weather, we get together and about a couple hours before we fly. And we will fly for about four hours and then come back here and land, and the scientists take a look at the data. And we do that just about every morning that the fields are And now, pilots, what, is, what are the planes like that you're flying out there? I wish we had a picture of it, but uh, you can Google an image of an HU-25 Guardian, and there's some pictures of our plane scheme on it from NASA. And we got our twin-engine jet from the Coast Guard. We currently have one that's flying right now, and another one's about to uh, start flying again, and then landing. And it seats right now the uh, two pilots, and we carry three researchers with us. And that's how we float up from Virginia as well. Excellent. And so now you guys are up there in Greenland. Nathan, you're down at the other end of the Earth. Are you doing similar flights from down there in Puentes Aires, uh, Chile? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, we also have a, it's a, it's not a large plane, but it's, it's decent size. And we have uh, our two pilots that fly on board. We have uh, laser operator, a camera operator, and then the techs on board, and uh, there are longer flights out to Antarctica. It's uh, to the southern uh, or the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. It takes about two hours to get down there. So just our transit to and from Antarctica is pretty long. So our flights are about ten or ten and a half hours uh, every day, um, and some of our targets are actually quite far. Uh, 
something like the the gets gets as G E T Z uh, ice shelf is actually quite far away, so it takes almost four hours to get there. Uh, we also have a mission that we haven't flown yet to the South Pole, uh, and that's pretty much just a flying. We kind of fly a circle around the South Pole, go to the South Pole, and then go up. So uh, it's always dependent on weather. We don't ever know where we're going to fly until that morning, and then we kind of make a call to to decide where we're going to fly. Fantastic. Thanks so much. That's Nathan Kurtz, of course. Um, he is down at uh, Puente Aires, Chile. And now we have a school who's joining us. Hello, school. If you guys want to unmute yourselves and see, do you have any questions for the scientists that are there? The school that's joining us is the Naval Academy Primary School, which is uh, located in Maryland. Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> So what question? Hi. More of us. There's that more. Hi. Okay. So so what question? What questions do you have for the pilots? Let's have one of you guys ask a question of the pilot. Uh, anyone? How long did it take for them to get there? Okay. Did you guys hear that? So. So the question the school just asked, um, and I put them on mute just because there's a bunch of them there, but the question they just asked was, how long did it take you to get there? Let's go to the gentleman in, in Greenland first. How long did it take you to physically get up to Greenland to even start doing your job? And I think your microphone's muted, so you want to unmute your microphone. Let's see. Can we hear you? If you're in Greenland, try unmuting your microphone there. There you are. There we go. We just just unmuted. Um, my name's Greg again. And, oh, Greg, uh, we have our, our airplane is out of uh, Langley Research Center in Virginia. So we flew from Virginia up to Greenland. It took us uh, three flights and about seven flight hours. We stayed overnight in Goose Bay, Canada. Um, the airplane can actually get there a little quicker, but because of the remote location of Greenland, we had to make sure to carry extra fuel reserve. So we left uh, Goose Bay, Canada, and landed at Kangaroo-Suak, Greenland, before coming up to Tuvalu Air Base. Uh, that allowed us to carry the extra fuel reserves needed in order to get up here uh, safely. And for the operational missions, we also carry extra fuel, which keeps the sorties down uh, only four hours maximum. Excellent. And now, Nate, to you, how long did it take you to just physically get down to Chile to start even doing this job? Uh, it took me about, I believe, 30 hours. Uh, uh, I flew from uh, Washington, D.C., down to Miami, down to Santiago. It was flying overnight, and then I waited in the Santiago airport. And uh, flew down to the, the southern tip of Chile. So the the plane that we took down here uh, took off from Colorado, just outside of Denver. Uh, they flew, it took them two days to get down. They they stopped in Arica, Chile. They picked up uh, an observer from the, the Chilean military. To On the way down, we, we actually flew over several different targets. We flew over Costa Rica and, and the... Uh, volcanoes in Chile. So on the way down, we turned the laser on and turned the cameras, and we were actually taking measurements on the way down in several places. So uh, about two days to, to get down here. Excellent. Okay, so Naval Academy, let's go back to you guys. Do we have another question for our scientists there? And don't forget to unmute yourself first. And you do that by going to the very top of your screen. What's the weather like down there? Down there. In Greenland. In up. Greenland's up. Turn this down. All right. Let's, let's, let, let's go to Nate first. Um, Nate, tell us what the weather's like down there, and then we'll go up there. So, Nate, you're, you're essentially down there um, in Chile. Yes. So the weather in Chile, because it's the southern hemisphere, the, the seasons are, are opposite. So it's just coming out of winter uh, and coming into spring. So it's it's a little bit chilly. It's maybe 40 degrees on average here. Uh, so 
But the big difference here, uh, the winds are very, very strong. Uh, it's very common to get just, I don't even know how fast <laughs> of winds. And uh, I mean, it's it's constantly blowing. And so uh, this is actually a, a hazard for the, the plane itself because if the winds get too strong, we actually have to move the plane uh, away. So, but otherwise it's, it's pretty nice in, in Chile actually. And now up there in Greenland, let's have you guys talk about the weather. I mean, from the parka, from the clothes you're wearing, the parka you're wearing, it looks like it's pretty cold. It has been really cool. It actually started out at about uh, minus 10 degrees Celsius earlier in the week, but we had really nice and clear skies. And unfortunately, we just had a blizzard last night where it was blowing snow and with about 50 to 60 knot winds. So we were all confined to our quarters last night. No one was allowed out. And uh, we just came out of our lockdown earlier uh, this this morning. But it's still blowing snow out there. It's about 25 miles an hour, and unfortunately no one was able to fly today. Uh, so the weather's been pretty rough, but fortunately some of our science targets are away from the air base. So as long as the plane can take off, there's other parts of Greenland that have decent weather that we can fly over. It sounds, that sounds that sounds pretty intense. So we have some video that I'm going to throw to a little bit to play, and I'm thinking that Nate um, and can talk about it a little bit. Um, sorry, and let's see if it's going to play. These are essentially what I believe are flyovers. Nathan, can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here? Uh, wait, I don't see the video yet. Oh. I see... Let's see what we what I'm this seeing on Jefferson screen there should be at the top. Well, let's go back. Okay. Oh, are you seeing it? Oh, I see it now. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, so this is a flyover of uh, an ice sheet. Uh, it's see the the crevasses. That's flying over a mixture of water and ice there. So probably along the edge of an ice sheet. So that rough area, those are crevasses in the ice. Sometimes they get very very deep. Uh, that's what you want to avoid if you're walking on the plane. This is the plane that we're taking down south in Chile. It's called the G5. Uh, that looks like, oh, oh, that's, and so this is the plane from Langley. This is the Falcon that they're taking in Greenland. So uh, the two planes that we have on the, the mission right now. Uh, let's see, there's, uh, that's our mission scientist. Uh, his name's John Sontag. He's up in Greenland as well. Uh, he decides uh, things like checks the weather, make sure uh, everything's going smoothly, uh, makes calls on the ground. So we have him up in Greenland and I'm down here and uh, in Chile doing a, a similar job right now. And now uh, this a question for you, uh, Nathan. So why do two campaigns at the same time? Why, why not just focus on one at a time? Uh, in the past, we had uh, focused on, on one campaign at a time, uh, putting on different instruments, more instruments on one plane. This year, we don't have the, the planes that can fit all the instruments that we have. So we decided to take planes that fly at high altitude and take more specific kinds of measurements. And so by doing that, we can actually take measurements at different times of the year. Usually, we had been taking measurements always in the spring. So it's now spring in the southern hemisphere. And we'd always been going to the uh, Greenland and the Arctic in March and April and May, which is also the, the springtime. Uh, when you take measurements at different times of the year, so now we're in the, the fall uh, time in Greenland, it's just after the summertime. So in summer, uh, everything's melting, obviously. Uh, not all of Greenland starts to melt, typically. Uh, but a large portion does. And so we don't always know what happens, how much snow is melting, how much snow is falling. So when we come back in the fall, after we've taken measurements in the spring, we can get a sense of, well, what happened over the summer, uh, doing things like we try to improve predictive models. So what's going to happen to Greenland uh, many years from now? And to do that, we have to know, well, how good are our models and how good are we representing certain physical processes? So by going in the fall, it gives us more more information basically to to do that. 
Okay, wonderful. Let's go back to the school for a second and have, see if you guys have another question for our scientists. Let's go back over here. You guys should, are probably the big bucks there. So let's hear again from the Naval Academy. And um, don't forget to unmute your microphones and give us another question. Um, what animals have they seen up in Greenland? All right, now mute your microphone again, and that sounds like a question for, for John Woods up there in Greenland. Have you seen any animals? I know you're, you're obviously focused on studying the ice, but what wildlife do you have to be aware of up there? So actually there's a pretty large family of Arctic foxes that live on the base. We pass them almost every day, and uh, some really, it's been really neat to watch them uh, getting their winter coats filled in. So they, they started out almost lacking color, and they're actually turning much more white. And it's just in good time since uh, the snow has started to fall, and they're blending in with their environment much better now. And uh, also, one day, uh, when we weren't flying, I was able to get up off base a little bit and see some Arctic hares, which are really impressive, some of the largest bunnies I've ever seen. And they, uh, they're, they're quite funny looking. They stand up on their hind legs, and uh, they run or hop pretty fast. So we saw a couple dozen Arctic hares as well when we were off base the other day. And now back down to Nate. Uh, are there similar types of animals that you have to be concerned about when you're doing the flights from uh, Punta Aires, Chile? Uh, not so much in in Chile. Uh, in terms of flying, we do have to we do fly over uh, penguin colonies. Now, this mission we don't have to worry about flying over the penguin colonies because we're we're high altitude, so we're we're far enough away not to bother them. In the past. We had flown low altitude, and so we actually had to have a map of where where all known penguin colonies are, so we can maneuver around them because uh, we don't want to interfere with anything. That, I, I think the plane actually, because it's so loud, it actually disrupts their their uh, environment, and and so we do have to be aware of that. Um, we do see wildlife from the air. Not we haven't seen any from the high altitude, but uh, in the past do see seals. Seals are, there's some very large seals that we can see down on the ice from the air. Uh, other than that, I mean Antarctica itself, other than penguins, I don't, there's no large animals. And so just, just on the ice around it that we will see, uh, yep, lots of seals. Uh, also, I guess to bring it back up to, to Greenland, there are polar bears around Thule <laughs> to be careful of. They don't always hang around there, but um, I have been around when uh, last spring when we were there. Uh, there was actually they had found a polar bear not too far off. I think it was about 15 miles off off the base. Great. Let's go back to the classroom again and get another question from the Naval Academy kids. Hi guys. So don't forget to unmute your microphone and give us a question. Margaret, you can ask. Wait. Is it hard work? Is it hard work? Say it louder. Is it hard work? That's a good question. All right, is it hard work? Let's go up to John up there in uh, in Greenland first. John Woods, the project manager. So, is it hard work? You were talking about a blizzard yesterday. That did not sound like easy work to me. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely a hard work environment, and it's really long days. You have to wake up really early and check the weather. Uh, so even if you know the weather doesn't look that promising, we still have to get up and go through the normal routine to see if we can possibly fly. And then if we do fly, uh, for instance, on the, the last day before the storm hit, we were actually able to fly two missions. So the pilots were out for four hours, came back, got a quick bite to eat, uh, refueled the airplane, and then flew again for another four hours. So they were up in the air for eight hours, and then not to mention the, the crew on the ground to support the plane. Uh, they had to be here, you know, before the flight and then again after the flight. So definitely hard work and a challenging environment, but it's really rewarding and fun. It's a really neat, uh, neat experience to be up there in Greenland. And now, Nate, on to you a little bit. They asked if, if it was hard work. Obviously it is, but, I mean, how do you deal with the extensive amounts of darkness and sunlight that you have to deal with for these kinds of scientific work? Uh... It's actually, at least where we are, it's the, the latitude's not 
far enough away, so we don't have to deal with too much uh, excessive light and dark. In Greenland, it's much different. So, um, but otherwise, I think the most challenging thing, I guess, in terms of visit hard work, is is a lot of what John said in terms of we have to get up very early to to check weather. When we do fly, it's ten and a half hour flights, and then we come back and we always want to check everything that we had done. So we do that in the night or the next day uh, and to always try to plan for the next day. So days are long, uh, but again, it's, it's definitely very rewarding and fun. Okay, so let's go back to the school again. School, hi. All right, so let's get another question from you guys about the science that they're doing up there, if you have it. So don't forget to unmute your microphones. And to unmute, you go to the top of your screen. All right, go ahead, school. Well, uh, do you like eat different foods up in Greenland? All right, down so chili. The question. And down in chili. <laughs> the question is, and we put you guys back on mute. And hey, John, let's. I think your mic's open. Mike, so they were talking about. I'm sorry, uh, your microphone's open. So John Woods, you're talking about what kinds of food you eat up there. I can imagine it can be quite comforting to come in and have something warm after these blizzard conditions. Yeah, so we actually eat pretty well up here. Uh, Greenland is actually a uh, Danish-owned island, so there's a lot of uh, uh, Danish food, so authentic uh, Danish food, a lot of fish, a lot of, uh, a lot of different meats that you might not normally experience in the United States. But they also do have a lot of American offerings. But usually at, a, at each meal, I like to try at least one authentic uh, Danish Danish uh, uh, food. But they definitely uh, feed us pretty well. Although, again, last night, since we had the blizzard, no one was allowed out. So we had to make our own dinner uh, in our dorm rooms. And they actually handed out uh, meals ready to eat, which are like the Army uh, boxed meals for, for breakfast this morning until the base opened back up. And now, so what's a traditional Danish meal? So lots of different uh, different fish, some raw fish, which uh, I've tried but not enjoyed too much. Uh, some different types of sausages. They have hot dogs here that they call hot dogs that do not look like our hot dogs. But again, everything seems to be worth a try at least once. And now, Nate, you're down in a completely different part of the world. And Nathan, is it different down there with what you're eating, or is it a similar fish-based food? Uh, it's it's quite a bit different. Um, I think Chile has its own kind of cuisine, and most of the restaurants here that we eat are Chilean. But since we're in southern Chile, I think the biggest difference is that there's just not many uh, fruits and vegetables, except for canned foods. So there's very, uh, yeah, just very little fresh fruits and vegetables. So a lot of the food is meat, cheese. Uh, they do like their sweets here. So they have excellent selection of cakes and things like that. But uh, other than that, uh, it is it is pretty good food. But again, <laughs> not many vegetables and fruits. So <laughs> not so much healthy eating, I would say. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the science of this mission a little bit. Um, an ice bridge is not only studying land ice, it's also studying um, ice sheets and glaciers and sea ice. So Nathan, we're going to play some of this video. Can you explain a little bit about what we're seeing as this plays? So what you can see, the, the border around Antarctica, it's kind of shifting. That's the edge of the sea ice. So. Uh, as the season changes, the sea ice grows and shrinks based on winds and how cold it is. Uh, so this video is, you can see mountains in the background, but then the, the water itself, the ocean surface, freezes and it gets quite thick at times. But what we're seeing here is sort of a mixture of the, the darker ice isn't quite as thick. Uh, has to, doesn't have any snow on it, but then you see it mixed in with uh, ice that does have snow on it. Uh, so it, it's probably a bit thicker. Uh, just and it moves around quite a bit so you're seeing you don't just see a, a big white sheet of ice it's more typical in the Arctic in the Antarctic you see a lot more variety just because of 
the ice is thinner, it moves around more, uh, it's more expansive. So this is very new ice. Probably the ice had opened up a bit. Uh, it's just so cold and it, it freezes over. Uh, this this looks like near the uh, edge of the Antarctic. So in the background, you can side, see the edge of the, the ice sheet. And what happens is there's very strong winds. They just blow. They push the ice away from the uh, from the continent, and it keeps the the ocean ice free. But then it starts to form new ice. It's just just so cold down there. Uh, here, there looks like icebergs mixed in with the ice. So the the icebergs calve off the land, and the strong out the continent, blowing the ice away. But it's in the process, kind of creating new ice. So. This is uh, one of our instruments taking uh, pictures on board the aircraft. So here's a, a field of icebergs. So this is near the continent, uh, just calving off lights of big icebergs that you can see. Uh, it means these things are just huge. They're they're massive, uh, easy to spot from the air. Uh, this again, icebergs mixed in with the uh, ice. Here's uh, some more sea ice. Uh, a bit hard to tell what's going on in, in this sea ice, but uh, so that again looks like all uh, Antarctic sea ice. And one easy way to tell is it's the I guess the sheer variety. So from the snow covered to the non snow covered, uh, and again the the huge icebergs all over uh, Antarctica just calves off so many icebergs. So uh, it's pretty much what we're seeing on the flight. So. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Nathan um, Kurtz. Hey, let's go back up to John Woods uh, real quick up there. I'm wondering, we hear a lot about how things are melting at our polar regions, and I know that's one of the parts of this mission is to keep track of this ice. Have you been able to see uh, differences as you go out from year to year? Yeah, definitely. That's exactly what we're trying to do is by measuring the, uh, the melt. Uh, summer or fall season right now compared to what we saw in the previous March uh, season. I do believe that every year that they come up here, they do see a little bit less ice each time. So there definitely does seem to be a, a decline in the ice, and that's exactly what these measurements work, so we can track that, that decline in the ice. And uh, I know this is my first time in the uh, fall time, so I have nothing to really compare it to, but I know when I was up here springs ago, uh, and talking to the people that, that have lived up here for seven, eight, nine plus years, they have mentioned that they're, they have definitely seen a decline and a change in the amount of snow and, and cold weather experience. And now, John, up there in Thule, Greenland, um, I know the flights are higher this year in altitude. We're going to look at a little bit of video of that, but while we're doing that, can you explain what's the importance of flying at different altitudes above the ice? Yeah, so the, the plane that we're on this year, it's a, uh, as the pilots explained, it's an old Coast Guard plane, and uh, it's really optimized to, to fly at a higher altitude, so you can get a much longer range, so you can fly much longer missions when it's up at altitude. And the instrument that we're using, that we've been using in the past at lower altitudes, they've, they've modified it to be able to those higher altitudes. So this is the first time that they've flown it this high, uh, over green. So they're kind of working out the bugs, but they've been collecting some great data. And uh, they're really looking forward to, uh, to using it again this way in the future if we can't get back down to lower altitudes. Excellent. Okay, let's go back to that Naval Academy and have you guys do one more question. I think we have time for probably two more questions. Let's do one now. So, don't forget to unmute. There you go. What is the time? Oh, what is the time difference? All right, so the question is what is the time difference? Go to Nathan Kurtz first down there in Chile. Uh, the time difference here, it's only one hour time difference from uh, the eastern U.S., so the eastern time zone. So not much different. It's one hour ahead. 
And up there in uh, Greenland? Yeah, so we're only an hour, we're an hour ahead, but even more interesting, I think, is that we're losing about 15 minutes of daylight a, a day. So since we've been up here, the sun has risen an hour later each morning. So when we used to go to breakfast and to the early morning weather brief the first day we got here, it was sunny out, and now it's dark. And then when we come in at night, again, it's getting darker a lot sooner. And you can you definitely notice the difference from day to day of how they're losing up here until they'll actually go into complete darkness here in another couple of weeks. And now the main question, you guys, we both introduced you as a either project manager or a scientist for Operation Icebridge. The biggest question we get is exactly what is this ice bridge? What are you trying to bridge between the two? Nathan Kurtz, let me have you answer that one. So the concept of the bridge came out. Uh, we uh, NASA had a satellite called ISAT, which was launched in 2003. It was a laser taking measurements of the surface. Uh, ISAT failed in 2009, and the next version of ISAT is actually not set to launch uh, for about another two years. So in the meantime, NASA uh, decided to have a plane take similar kinds of measurements. And so that's sort of the bridge that we're trying to, to do is, is bridge these two satellites, so make sure we're not missing something. Uh, but in the meantime, you can actually put a lot more instruments than on a plane than you can on a satellite. So we, we typically fly a set of lasers, uh, radar, very different kinds of radars for um, uh, some radars measure how deep the snow is. They don't go down very far under the ground. Uh, other radars that we have actually go all the way to the bottom of the ice sheet. So uh, can go down more than a mile into the ice just to, to see how thick it is, where the rock is. So uh, other things that are on we have, sometimes have an instrument that measures the gravity field. And based on very small changes in the gravity, you can tell uh, sort of what kind of material is under the ice. So this video is showing the, the concept of the radar. So the plane's flying over an ice shelf, in this case, taking laser measurements at the top, a radar that's going down underneath. And so when we combine the two, the, the radar going underneath, we get a sense of, well, are we losing ice? If we're losing ice, or are we losing snow? Uh, are we gaining ice? Are we gaining snow? So really, what's happening to, to change the ice sheets? And so putting as much as we can onto a plane, taking all these different measurements, uh, tell us what's happening to the ice. And so bridging this gap between the, the ice set satellites uh, helps us do that. Fantastic. All right, so one last question from the Naval Academy kids who've been joining us. Let me go over to you guys. So this is one last question from you guys. Make it a good one. Oh, and don't forget to turn your microphone back on. You have to do it up at the top of your screen. Abby. There you go. Okay. We can hear you now. Hi. Um. Affecting you? They know we're I say, do you know we have a hurricane? Ah, so the question is Do you know we're having a hurricane right here? <laughs> ah, okay, there you go. So let's uh, throw it up to John first. Is is the hurricane that we're having here on the east coast of the United States affecting you guys? Do you want to hear your question answered? Not affecting us directly, no, but a lot of the people uh, that are from uh, that are on the crew here. Are from the Virginia area, so they're they're pretty nervous. I know my family's back home there in Annapolis, so we're thinking about everyone with the hurricane coming up the East Coast, and we've been watching the weather closely there as we have up here. Excellent. And now on to you, Nate. Are you having the same thing with just the people? You're here. You are at a rather extreme part of the world, but here we're having rather extreme weather right off the East Coast of the U.S. Yeah, it's it's pretty much what John said. My family is back in Maryland. Uh, some of the crews has family out, uh, in the path of the hurricane, so that's pretty much the extent of it. Otherwise, no other direct impact on the mission. There are can be other uh, factors like that do have an impact. There was uh, an earthquake not too long ago, just off of Chile, which 
ended up delaying some of our shipments a little bit. Uh, a volcano went off uh, on one of our planned flight tracks. We had to divert around it a little bit. So <laughs> there are always natural disasters that happen. We just got uh, to prepare for it. Okay, so John, just as we're going to wrap up here, let's go back up to you to Greenland. If you can tell us a little bit more about maybe what's going to be happening in the next few days or what you're going to do with the data when you get back down, back home. Yeah, so we're actually uh, up here in, in Thule, Greenland, until Wednesday. And then actually we're taking a, a, our NASA jet. We'll go down about two hours south of here to a smaller town called King or Lusawak, Greenland. Two weeks out of there, lots of science targets down in the southern part of the uh, of the island. So we're hoping to get two more uh, science flights in on Monday and Tuesday. Unfortunately, the airport is closed here on Saturday and Sunday. We're we're hoping actually to get two more flying days in, and possibly even two two research flights in each of those days before we go down for another two weeks in southern. Fantastic. And now Nathan Kurtz down there in uh, Chile. Tell us a little bit about the final bit of what you're going to be working on. Uh, so we have about another month that we'll be down here. Right now we're actually fine because weather is just too bad over all of Antarctica. There's just clouds everywhere. Or as we found out, it's actually too cold for the plane to fly in some places. It's, it's 80 below zero. So the plane does not fly. <laughs> gets too cold for that. So uh, we're, it's looking like weather is going to be better tomorrow, so uh, probably fly around the Antarctic Peninsula, and that's pretty much what we'll, we'll keep doing. Well, as long as the plane, nothing's wrong with the plane, uh, instruments are working, and weather's good, we'll, we'll just keep flying back and forth. Fantastic. All right, so let's go back to the Naval School, just have you guys say goodbye. Thanks so much for joining us. You guys want to say? <laughs> and that got a little loud here in, in Greenbelt, Maryland. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, John. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, so this has been a uh, live, obviously, uh, Google Plus Hangout. Um, I'm Mary's Keck here at Greenbelt, Maryland for Goddard Space Flight Center. And I really want to thank both Nathan Kurtz and John Woods from the Operation Icebridge team. Thank you guys so much for joining us from both ends of the Earth. And we hope you have safe travels back here, back home. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.